you probably remember what it was like when you came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. You were excited, humbled, and grateful. You gladly gave all praise to God for, in the words of John Newton, saving a wretch like me. However, this was not the case with Finney. In 1821, he claims he was converted. The reason I say claims is because Finney's account or testimony should, for the Bible-believing Christian, be suspect. Why? On page 16 of his memoirs, in relating the story of his conversion, he uses the word I and other forms of self-reference, me and myself, 34 times. He mentions God only twice. As he continues his testimonial on the next page, he registers 31 references to himself and never mentions God. On page 18, it gets a little better for the Lord because he is mentioned seven times, though this pales in comparison to Finney's references to himself, which occur 32 times. This was not unusual for Charles Finney. As this presentation unfolds, we will see that Finney credits himself for his salvation. He believes that his conversion to Christ was not in the hands of a sovereign God, but in his own. So how did Finney come to believe in self-conversion? The answer is simple. Finney did not believe in sola scriptura, that is, scripture alone. Though he claimed that his teachings were based on the Word of God, in his systematic theology, which may be better called an anthropology, one must get to page 24 before he cites a text from the Word of God. And please note, I am referencing the abridged edition. According to one scholar, in the 1851 unabridged edition, one must read to page 78 before the first passage of Scripture is quoted. You may object to this observation on the grounds that Finney started each sermon or lecture with a passage from the Bible. However, upon reading the entire discourse, one is left with the nagging question, what did that text have to do with his sermon? Finney's purpose in beginning with God's Word was not to exegete the passage, but as a pretext to springboard into a diatribe of his own making rendering his opening text as merely a symbolic gesture. You may be saying to yourself that this is inconclusive. Does this really prove that Finney abandoned Sola Scriptura? Well, let's consider this possibility. First, remember that false teachers love to cite the Bible. However, it is almost always out of context. Satan even quotes the Bible while tempting Christ in Matthew chapter 4. Second, false teachers may hold to the word, but deny its substance. The Apostle Peter warns in 2 Peter 3 that unstable men rest or twist God's word as they do with the rest of Scripture to their own destruction. In moments of candor, this usually comes to light, as in this quote in Finney's own words. I had nowhere to go but directly to my Bible and to the philosophy or workings of my own mind as they were revealed in consciousness. Though in Finney's words he went directly to his Bible, it would appear that his final appeal was to reason, and that reason started and ended with his own mind. Dr. John MacArthur explains, his legal training had conditioned Finney to think logically but it had also saddled him with a world of wrong presuppositions. Finney's notions of justice, guilt, righteousness, transgression, forgiveness, sovereignty, and a host of other terms were drawn from his legal studies, not the scriptures. Philip Johnson of the Spurgeon Archives, in his article, Wolf in Sheep's Clothing, reaches the same conclusion. Finney, abandoned sola scriptura, the authority and sufficiency of scripture, as shown by his constant appeal to rationalism in support of his new theology. Citing again Philip Johnson, who explains what Finney did when he could not find scriptural support for his theology. He resorts to sophistry to explain it away, 
Whole sections of his systematic theology contain paragraph after paragraph of philosophizing and moralizing, sometimes without a single reference to scripture for many pages. Further elaboration comes from the pen of Dr. Michael Scott Horton. One need go no further than the table of contents of his systematic theology to learn that Finney's entire theology revolved around human morality. Chapters 1 through 5 are on moral government, obligation, and the unity of moral action. Chapters 6 and 7 are obedience entire, as chapters 8 through 14 discuss attributes of love, selfishness, and virtue and vice in general. Not until the 21st chapter does one read anything that is especially Christian in its interest. It is interesting to note that most systematic theologies start with a chapter dealing with the Bible as the Word of God. In fact, from an epistemological standpoint, it should be the first doctrine with which a theologian begins. Not only does Finney not start with the doctrine of Scripture, he never mentions this doctrine anywhere in his systematics. In order to justify our beliefs, we must all answer the question, by what standard? Unfortunately, Finney's answer set aside the doctrine of sola scriptura and elevated his own reason to a level that was equal to or higher than God's word. Thank you.